Brethren, you gladly suffer the foolish, whereas yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take from you, if a man be lifted up, if a man strikes you on the face. I speak according to dishonor, as if we had been weak in this path, wherein if any man dare, I speak foolishly, I dare also. They are Hebrews, so am I. They are Israelites, so am I. They are the seed of Abraham, so am I. They are the ministers of Christ, I speak as one less wise, I am more. In many more labors, in prisons more frequently, in stripes above measure, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times did I receive forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I was in the depth of the sea. In journeying often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils from my own nation, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils from the false brethren, in labor and painfulness, in much watchings, in a hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things which are without my daily instance, the solicitude for all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is scandalized, and I am not on fire. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things that concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knoweth that I lie not. At Damascus, the governor of the nation under Aretas the king, guarded the city of the Damascenes to oppress me, and uh, through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall, and so escaped his hands. If I must glory, it is not expedient indeed, but I will come to the visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body I know not, or out of the body I know not, God knoweth, such a one was wrapped even to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, that he was caught up into paradise and heard secret words which is not granted to man to utter. For such an one I will glory, but for myself I will glory in nothing but in my infirmities. For though I should have a mind to glory, I shall, not, I shall not be foolish, for I will say the truth. But I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth in me, or anything he heareth from me. And lest the greatness of the revelation should exalt me, there was given me a sting of my flesh, an angel of Satan, to buffet me. For which thing thrice I besought the Lord that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for power is made perfect in infirmity. Gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And the Gospel is according to St. Luke. At a time when a very great multitude was gathered together and hastened out of the cities unto him, he spoke uh, by a similitude. The sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And uh, another, some uh, fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And other, some fell among thorns, and the thorns, growing up with it, choked it. And other, some fell upon good ground, being sprung up, yielded fruit a hundredfold. Saying these things, he cried out, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him what this parable might be, to whom he said, To you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to the rest in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God, and they by the wayside are they that hear. 
Then the devil cometh and taketh the word out of their heart, lest believing they should be saved. Now they upon the rock are they whom, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no roots, for they believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they who have heard, and going their way are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and yield no fruit. But that on the good ground are they who in a good and perfect heart, hearing the word, keep it and bring forth fruit in patience. So, uh, uh, my dear faithful, uh, next time I come will be in uh, June. In the meantime, it's Falpico, who is in charge of uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. Pray for the ordination of uh, Sunil. There is an Indian ordination coming next June. Um, Bishop uh, Williamson will come to India to confer that ordination that should help us to uh, maybe to bring uh, more an increased frequency of masses. Uh, since uh, Australia is also helping out for the building of the prior of Father Valan, I am expecting them, out of simple gratitude, to give you a higher frequency of, uh, of masses. And um, the, the news in the resistance at large is, uh, is um, that it is still uh, growing, especially uh, around your area in uh, New Zealand. Uh, there, are, there were five, five families this morning at Mass, and they, uh, they are catching up on you, even if you are still uh, ahead of them by uh, a little bit. But, uh, you know, keep on praying so that they don't uh, uh, catch up as fast as you grow yourself. And uh, we have new missions in uh, Thailand. In Thailand, there is a group of uh, 11 uh, faithful, and we had some developments in Japan and uh, some uh, more missions in the Philippines, in, uh, for instance in Zamboanga, the uh, mainstream uh, SSPX has been wiped out twice. Father Tim tried to go there and Father Hora went there to say Mass. They had to go back and nobody wanted to attend their Mass. And so they were entirely uh, wiped out from Zambu Zamboanga. It's in the very south of the Philippines and we have three groups over there. They are still very weak, they are very fragile but they deserve our attention. And so please do pray very hard so that we get more priests down the line to take care of these people, to take care of you better. Now, Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. My dear faithful, there is always the fight of the two seeds. In the, in the leaflet of uh, Father Pico, there is this famous verse of the Apocalypse that the dragon fights against what is left of the seed of the woman. There is uh, an enmity between the woman and the serpent, and between, not just the woman and the serpent, between her seed and the seed of the serpent. The whole history of the church is a fight between two seeds. If you look at a piece of grass, a piece of lawn, or a field, you ask the scientist, and they will tell you, all these plants, all these weeds, all this grass are all fighting each other constantly. They are, you know, sending uh, chemical warfare on the others. And there are plenty of tricks to go around the other or to take topple and take over uh, the other. You will have this fight of the two seeds until the end of times. When Rebecca saw that uh, you know, is, uh, that um, Esau was, uh, you know, courting uh, the Moabites, was courting the pagan girls. Rebecca said, that's not good. This is going to lead to a, a wrong seed. I have got to do something. And she derailed the inheritance of uh, Esau in favor of Jacob, Jacob, who was a good seed. And um, there is Saul, and then there is David. There is... Uh, Cain and there is Abel. Always God has to take a seed and restart. He restarts with Noah, he restarts with, uh, with Abraham. And this is uh, the tribulation until the end of times. And uh, our seed 
is always in danger of being reduced, of being, uh, um, of being uh, diminished. And that's why we must not be surprised in the history of the church if God has always uh, mercilessly cut down the, uh, the wrong seed. Because the good seed retains its power. It, it retains its power to conquer the entire world. It, it has the code. It has the message. And this is for what we fight. You know, if you ask the position of the resistance, it's very simple. They ask me sometimes, what's the position of the resistance? What? They, 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 they call us the resistance. And that name is sticking to us like a tick on the mule. It's, it is not defining us properly as such. It's a negative term, like immaculate. Immaculate is something without something. The resistance is a resistance against something. It's a resistance basically against three things. The, uh, uh, a, a false worship, a false dogma, and a false law. And so we are resisting and we are, we are fighting unto the demolition and the entire uprooting of a wrong seed. And that seed is the, the false worship, the wrong worship, which is a new mass. That new mass needs to be forbidden. Not just put alongside with the true mass. Not just say that uh, we can collaborate with it in the ropes, like the society is doing unfortunately today. They took in the seminary of Flavigny, Bishop Schneider, and Bishop Schneider, for the first time in the history of the society, gave lectures to the society seminary, to the seminarians, several times. And after he was done with the seminary of Flavigny, he went to the other reconciled seminaries of the Fraternity of St. Peter of the Institute of Good Shepherd. This is what I found out on their websites. And this Bishop Schneider says a new mass. He's a novice order bishop in Kazakhstan. And the fact that he's against communion in the hand makes no difference. We are for the demolition of the new mass. So anyone who says the new mass is of the wrong seed. You are allowing the wrong seed to survive and to come in and to multiply. That's not good. And then the other seed is, of course, Vatican II. Vatican II needs to be anathematized as a whole, including, you include in this whole, the 95% uh, uh, so-called good parts of the council. You throw and the water and the baby with the water, even when Vatican II says something which is true, because as Archbishop Lefebvre said in his book, I accuse the council, the good elements of Vatican II are means to carry heresy across. Just like, you know, the uh, Institute of Christ the King is using fine vestments, beautiful orbs, beautiful surplice, beautiful berettas, beautiful baroque churches, beautiful uh, pontifical ornaments. You go on their website, you check their website out, it's magnificent. They are using those beautiful things, those Catholic things, those Catholic appearances as a vector for the acceptance of reconciliation with the Nouveau Sordo Church, with Vatican II, with the New Code, and with the New Mass, ultimately down the line. And so whatever is good that the devil is using to carry the bad seed across, we can't have. The bad seed has to be, uh, to be um, uprooted. And then lastly, we are against a law, a wrong law, which is the new code of canon law that Archbishop Lefebvre never used in his lifetime. Not only he did not use the new code of canon law, but he told the society to avail itself of its own tribunal so that whenever there is a canonical necessity, this uh, commission of St. Charles Borromeo would solve the case, whether it be uh, a priest that ran away from the priesthood and uh, caused a scandal, whether a nun who falls from her vows, or the marriage cases. The Archbishop Lefebvre told us to stay away from the Roman tribunal and to keep out from uh, compliance to the uh, new code 
of uh, canon law. And that's the position of the resistance. In such a wise that when I talk canon law to Brother John in my seminary, we simply use Prumer of the 1930s something, and we only study the uh, code of 1970, 17, without reference to the new code. I only instruct Brother John on the evils of the new code. That's it. You can ask him, you can check with him. Why? Because even if there may be some good aspect in the, in, in the, in the new code, they don't redeem, they don't redeem the wicked seed which is in it. And so we have to follow the guidelines of uh, Arthur Lefer who say that the new code is Vatican II applied to legislation. And that the new code is worse even than the new mass. That's what he said. Did he say it or did he not say it? He said it. Therefore, we have to apply this treatment. But not only this, we must prevent the bad seed to come and to and to um, strangle the, the good seed, but the, the, the good seed needs to be uh, protected, it needs to be nurtured, it needs to go on a good ground. And that's why it is so much, very, uh, so much advised to you to put your seed in a good ground as much as you can, go to the countryside. If you are, if you are in a suburb, like most of you are here in, Bis in Brisbane, please have some rabbits in your backyard and some chicken, so that your kids worry about rabbits and chickens and cats and dogs and flowers, even most of them get destroyed, you know, along the process, and uh, toy trains and, and uh, doors and, uh, you know, plastic guns, but not, not the gadgets, not the, especially not the electronic gadgets of our time, because you want to protect the, the seed, this is what you have to do. It is not enough to not to let the bad seed come in, but you may, must let the good seed grow in a good ground. And um, provide, take care of your children so that they may grow in a, in a good ground. And the episode of today is about these uh, tribulations. We are testing the, all the limits of the tribulations of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is, uh, as you know so well, is going through uh, its uh, its passion, and uh, there are plenty of um, of miseries befalling the Catholic Church, <coughs> befalling the world of tradition, and perhaps you know befalling the the world of resistance, because even our smallness, our the ridiculousness of our small numbers, is no protection from the, the vials of the devil, who always try to destroy, to demolish the rest of the seed of the woman. And what does the woman do? Uh, she flees to the desert. That is, she goes to a place where God can be talked with. And she leaves the, uh, the place with the waters, where the great Babylon is sitting. She goes to the desert. That is, she finds a place where God can be talked to. She finds a place which is void. She clears the way for the soul to be capable to breathe. Because this civilization, which is all around you, is a civilization which is built against prayer. It is built against the uh, interior life. And so like the lady of the apocalypse, you, you, you have to follow her, if you want to keep this child alive, you have to go to the desert and, uh, and find a place for uh, your soul to take its rest, to find its nourishment. She went to the desert in order to provide nourishment to her son. You may say, but there is no food growing in the desert. But in, mystically, the, the food is found in the desert. When, uh, when the soul is, uh, has time when the soul is open, then the food can come in. If the soul is saturated with other things, with vanities, with the cares of this world, the, um, then the, the soul uh, cannot bear any fruit. That's what our Lord says. They were heard going their way, they were choked with the cares 
and the riches and the pleasures of this life. It's not just the pleasures. We always think it's the pleasures that make us fall into sin. But the care and the riches. If you care too much for those things, if you don't have any space available for prayer, you choke. You didn't find enough time to, uh, to feed your soul. And the danger today, you know, it takes more today to survive than, uh, than in years past. Because both on the spiritual level, the attacks are stronger, the surroundings are more dangerous, but on the doctrinal level, the attacks are more insidious and multiplied. That the, the devil has learned throughout the centuries how to fight better. So we don't have iconoclast Calvinists and Protestants coming into our mass centers and taking down the cross and, uh, and this. They did it before, you know. They only left this bare cross, the Calvinists and nothing else. But they are not coming after us anymore. The, uh, the subtleties is even beyond Cranmer. Cranmer said, no, don't take down the churches and the, uh, the furnishing. Just change the text of the mouse and just pray for the king, but not for the Pope. And that's all. And the English Catholics at the time could not see the difference all that much. Most of them said, I'll sit there and wait if it, if it gets worse. If it gets worse, then I'll jump out. I promise. We've heard that somewhere else. And Cardinal P said that with the French liberal Catholics, it was the same. They say, oh no, I, I stay in, I sit there, and I wait if it gets worse. If they sign a deal with Rome, uh, with the modernist Rome, then I jump out. That's what the liberal Catholics said in the 19th century. Of course, it was not a question of Rome at the time. Rome was doing the right thing. But they were waiting uh, that it would get worse before they would... Uh, separate or fight with Louis Philippe or Napoleon III or Lamné or uh, you know Chateaubriand uh, uh, and uh, Montalembert and all and and, um, and Monseigneur Dupont Loup and all that they are jump out if it gets worse but sure it got worse but it was too late they got they fell asleep and so it is for us we need to keep our eyes open on the, on what's coming so that's why I invite you to attend the, uh, the lecture, the conference, after this Mass. I don't want to be too long tonight, because the conference might be longer than expected. But uh, it's, um, it's a great tribulation. It's the fight of the two seeds. And it's, um, we are thankful to God that we have kept the Catholic faith, and we have kept this position, this position which is a right one. No new Mass, no Vatican II whatsoever, and no new code. If we stick to that position, we are safe enough to go across the to go across the uh, the valley and to emerge alive at the end of this uh, period of the history of the church. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.